Hello everyone, and as always, welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now today we are going to continue on with our Let's Play of Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admirals Edition. This is episode number 15. We are still in the Allied Setup phase, and today we look at the fascinating area of Malaya and the Malay Peninsula. There is a lot going on here, uh, and it, several interesting things that we'll get into. Also, this is in the eye of the storm. This is one of the first places we're setting up where the Japanese have already landed, and we have operations going on that are defensive <laughs> in nature, as you might imagine. Uh, all hell is breaking loose on the Malaya Peninsula, and this is kind of our dilemma that we face at the start of the game as the allied player, which is setting the bath water correctly. And what do I mean by that? You don't want to be too hot and you don't want to be too cold. You want to be retreating in good order. You know, you don't want everyone hightailing it down to Singapore. Uh, that's very tempting to try to get everyone out that you can. But you need to have delaying forces. You need to leave forces back that are going to slow down the Japanese. Because if they just have free run of it and show up at the Singapore doorstep in a couple, you know, a few days, you're in big trouble. Now in Malaya, this becomes even more obvious because you see the two long rail lines that run down the peninsula <clears throat> to the to the boot here, to the tip at Singapore. Um, as you see, the Japanese have landed at Kotaburu. They can cut you off if you're not careful. They will immediately start pushing down this rail line. But if they can get to Kuala Lumpur before you can get these forces out or back, you know, you're courting disaster. You're basically going to lose an entire division here. And so you have to start pulling them back but you also have to leave enough forces that the Japanese aren't running wild and can get around behind you because of that, right? And so you may think, well, I'm doing a great job getting these troops out as fast as I can, but if you're getting the wrong ones out as fast as you can and you don't stop the Japanese at all, you're actually kind of leading to your demise. So we'll be looking at all of that this time. We also have these Dutch subs up here that are patrolling the Gulf of Siam. And if I look at our uh, patrol zones, you can see we are all over any of these shipping lanes that will be coming into Kota Baru. Now, one thing you do have to watch out for, and we have left a delaying force there, is at Mersing. Uh, many times a good Japanese player or the AI will land or try to land at Mersing because it kind of cuts out all of this foreplay. Uh, it gets right to the point. You come in at Mersing uh, because if you're a good Japanese player, you say, oh, well, an allied player is just going to fall everything back to Singapore, especially at Mersing here where you have an Australian brigade out here. And I know that, you know, if you're an inexperienced allied player, you're like, oh, it's an Australian brigade. Let's get it to Singapore, get it back to Australia. Well, it costs a lot in political points to do that. So it's not always feasible, or I say always, it's, it's very seldom feasible to get the Australian troops off the Malaya Peninsula. Uh, it's, you know, we'll see how the game develops. You never quite know, but I would find it doubtful that we'll get them out here. We're, as a matter of fact, not even marching them. We're leaving them here in Mersing, and that really is as a blocking force against the Japanese saying, you know what, let's not even mess around up here. Let's do the end around, get here to Mersing. They come across this major highway. They have now completely surrounded or will completely surround all of these British troops. And so you have to be very careful to hold Mersing at least in in somewhat in force for a week or two weeks uh, until you can get troops down these rail lines and they won't be cut off from the ultimate safe base, which is Singapore, 
Uh, and so, again, it, it's yin and yang, and that's what we do as the allied player early in the game. So let's go to some of uh, the more interesting things during this setup. I thought it was all kind of interesting. Uh, there's just a bunch going on. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. So we've got the subs up here. We also have Task Force Z down here. Well, we no longer have Task Force Z because we have disbanded it in port, and that includes the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. Now, if we look at the British battleship, Prince of Wales, you will see a victory value of 202 points. You do not want this ship to be blown up. Surprise, surprise, right? You would know that even if it, you never saw the victory points, a British battleship is not something we want destroyed. Um, it's same with the Repulse. This is a, uh, oh shoot, what do they call this? It's like a British... Uh, Battle, oh, it's BC, Battle Cruiser. Okay, again, that's 202 points, a very nice ship. It also has radar, which is a little unusual this early in the game. Um, so this is a nice ship all around. These two ships, of course, we want to get out of here. And if you haven't played the game much, uh, and you're new to it, or you know, maybe if you have played the game for a while, you will be trying to you know, run these out of here as fast as you can, get them through the strait, and get them to Australia, or get them to Cape Town, or get them somewhere else, Colombo maybe. Um, but patience can be a virtue here, because you're probably saying, well, why are we taking these really two valuable ships, <clears throat> disbanding their task force, and p parking them here in Singapore? Well, the reason is Singapore, at this very moment, is the safest place for them. The Japanese have bombers now that could reach out here and touch us just south of Singapore. And so if you try to hightail it out with these guys, there's a decent chance that they will immediately come under a uh, bombing attack and you may lose them. So it's, it's probably advisable to be a little patient. Uh, and the reason I say they're the safest at Singapore is we've got cap up. You know, we've got a bunch of cap up here at Singapore. Oh, I say a bunch, you know, it's all relative, right? It's more than we usually have early in the game. So for instance, you've got 13 New Zealand fighters that are up. You've got some other Australian fighters that are up. You put those up and, you know, it, at least it gives some air cover to the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. We'll give it a turn or two. We'll kind of, you know, see the lay of the land. Are they, uh, can we tell that there's naval attack missions by the Japanese going on here? We'll see. If there's not, and we think the coast is clear, we'll try to get the heck out of there. Probably split those two ships up into separate task forces. Uh, maybe send a destroyer with them. So, you know, if we run into a submarine, a Japanese, Japanese submarine right off of Singapore, which we just might. Um, that's not a problem. I will also tell you that there are mines that are already laid by the Japanese off of Singapore. We want to give the minesweepers a chance to do their work. And right off the bat, one of the first messages you'll get in the game is that your minesweepers at Singapore are finding mines and blowing mines. That's another reason not to hightail it out of port with those two very valuable ships. So we'll give it a turn or two, clear some mines, see what the Japanese, you know, maybe can, we can kind of tell what their plans are, and we'll go from there. Uh, but for this episode, let's start up at the far north at Allure Star. Now, you know, I talk about this balance of getting down to Singapore, but also leaving blocking forces behind. Now you'll notice at a lower star, we are moving all three of this group out of here. And if you look down here, these two units, maybe it's all three, yes, all three units are part of the 11th Indian Division. The 11th Indi Indian Division is attached to the 3rd Indian Corps. And as you'll see, most of these troops uh, here, most of the British troops here in Malaya are part of that 3rd Indian Corps. But more specifically here, this 11th Indian Division, 
<clears throat> you maybe noticed during the setup, we're trying to get that entire division down to Kuala Lumpur, where we will put it back together. So that's something we really haven't done too much. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to, but this entire 11th division from a lore star and Taiping, which is just south of us here, this is Taiping, is all headed to Kuala Lumpur, and we are going to reconstitute the 11th Indian division. Now, one example, or one example, one advantage of making this into a division is that you get certain uh, buffs and bonuses for that when these all come together. So their assault values separately will not add up to their assault value together. You know, you just get certain efficiencies for putting a whole division together. So we will get a bonus when these um, groups all reform. And how will we do that? Well, when we get down to Kuala Lumpur and they're all sitting there, now they're all packing at this point. They're strategic moving to Kuala. Uh, when they get down there, and you can see it's three days, two days, and two days, all on the railroad we're headed down. Uh, when they all get down there, then We'll, this will light up for you, and it will say Rebuild Unit, um, and you can click on that, and all of a sudden we'll only have one counter, and it will be an infantry counter, it will have two X's, and it will be the 11th Indian Division. So that's kind of interesting. It's something new that we haven't done yet, really. I, I think I've mentioned it a few times. Now you may say, well, so we're not doing any blocking here. We're not doing any delaying here. Au contraire. Uh, we have this group down here. Let's make sure. Yep. The 316th Punjab Battalion Infantry Unit. It's got a 28 assault strength. So, you know, it's not much, but it's something. It's making a strategic move on railroad, and it's headed north to a lower star. It's also setting that as a as its objective and so I mean we're planning on just digging our heels in here now these guys when they got those orders must have said you know sir you have got to be wrong <laughs> why why are we heading north into the teeth of this juggernaut that will be coming south well you know in this game I guess in warfare in general some men have to make the sacrifices at this point it will be the 316th Punjab, which will come here to a lore star and try to hold for a few days, you know, try to hold off the Japanese a bit. Um, and so those were the main things that I wanted to talk about at a lore star. I, it will be, you know, kind of interesting when we do get this 11th division down there and we can, you know, hit rebuild unit, build them up, uh, and we'll have it will be at a full dis division strength here at Kuala Lumpur. Now it's not going to be enough uh, because the Japanese will be coming with quite a bit more than that. Uh, but that will set up our main blocking force again to make sure we're getting everyone out and to the south of Kuala Lumpur before the Japanese get there. Uh, and so, you know, it's a race. It's a race against time. Uh, and you kind of, again, have to be offensive and defensive with it. Th think it through. How long is it going to take them to take certain spots if you leave a blocking force of 28? Well, it may take an extra turn or two. You may be able to hold them off. So, you know, it's, those, those things go into the calculations. Um, now, this next place is just south of here, and that's Georgetown. Now, Georgetown's very interesting, right, because it's an island out here. Uh, it's connected to the mainland. Uh, but it's it's like a little island. There must be a bridge that runs across here. As a matter of fact, well, we'll look at that later. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, it's showing all yellow with some white there. Uh, anyway, in Georgetown, we will be putting... Oh, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, the pilots in the reserve pool. So when we set this up this time, there were these interesting notations with some of the air units. Um, and that was with some of these pilots that we had out here, we sent, so with, I think it was, yeah, it's the 3093. It instructed us, I say it, the spreadsheet put together by Cole, always as 
you know, always thank you to him for putting that together. It's helped a lot of people learn the game. But in his spreadsheet, he talks about taking your five worst defensive pilots and putting them in the reserve pool. And you may say, okay, wh why are we doing that? Well, first of all, you have some extra pilots here. We've got 18 Buffalo fighters. We're running 60 cap with them. So that's nice. That's a nice little force. You know, Buffaloes are fine. They're kind of your average fighter starting the game on the allied side. Um, so we're going to be running a nice 60% cap with them. Uh, but we had 23 pilots, and you see this 5 in parens. What, what is this about? Well, usually this 5 would be that, you know, these guys are somehow disabled. Uh, maybe they're, you know, they're just out of action. They need rest, or they're, they're not going to go on this rotation. Okay, well, let's go down here to pilots. And let's look at, this is something we haven't spent a lot of time on, because to be honest with you, I don't spend a lot of time on it in the game. I train pilots and I promote them and move them up. I don't often think about demoting them. Uh, you know, I say that in quotes. It's not the technical demotion. It's not like we're taking their rank and you know, and reducing it. It's more like we're just kind of taking them off the board. We don't want them flying missions. Well, you look at all of the different skills that pilots have, and again, it's just an amazing thing with this game we see all of our different pilots just here in georgetown they're all they've all got all of their individual stats it's pretty crazy right uh, but defense is one of their key stats here and this is what they would be doing at georgetown right they're going up they're flying cap and they're defending okay air to air is also very important obviously for fighter pilots because they are going to be dog fighting most of the time which is considered air to air but defending is really what they're doing here at georgetown you know these skills can kind of overlap right but defense is the main skill here now what what i did was i just sorted the pilots by clicking on defense and you see the defense skill rating here sorted from best to worst and these were our bottom five guys Shepard, McKinney, Wallace, Kirkman, and Harrison okay all I did and you know because the game's a little older this is now it's been lit up again but it's he's really not he's really great there we go I got him back to gray get this guy gray regardless it doesn't really matter whether he's colored gray or not you can look over here and see on the delay one 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 that we have clicked on the skies or on these guys to send them back to the reserve pool and then how do we do that so let's go to hood here we are not doing this with hood but you see as we roll over him click to send to the group reserve make inactive so you would click to the left or click the left mouse button and he would be sent to the reserve now this game is so good it's not going to just automatically send them to the reserve and everybody goes about their business you probably wouldn't even think about this but it is going to delay that for one day these guys got to pack up they got to get their stuff ready they've just gotten their orders you've got to get them out of here somehow so on and so forth so this is like strategic move how many days this is going to be one day where there's going to be a delay and then these guys will be in the reserve pool hopefully training up because this is not nearly good enough to be a fighter pilot in a defensive position now we do have some good ones right but for the most part they're not not so great we've got a lot of inexperienced poor air to air bad defensive pilots out here that's unfortunate uh, but I did want to show you that because that's something we haven't done before. You can always go here, look at your pilots and, you know, see each one, see what they're good at. Uh, you can move them about. Now, these guys here, if we right-clicked, we would make them active in our group again. Um, but right now, they're going to our... Uh, let's go up here left. They're going to our group reserve okay the guys that we've already sent to the group reserve if we double clicked them again would go to the general reserve pool okay and if you think about that that 
in the group reserve pool, they are still going to be you know, somewhat attached to this group. You can bring them back immediately. In the general reserve pool, they go back into the pool with all the pilots, uh, and they have no special affinity for this group. So that's how that works. We'll be talking more and more about pilots as the game goes on. I just wanted to talk about that for a moment because it's something new. Now in Georgetown, we are turning off repair, uh, which makes sense, right? We're going to be trying to do that. Every place that has industry, manpower, resources, uh, any, any of the production facilities, we will be turning off repair in places that are about to be bombed. And Georgetown will get absolutely just battered with Japanese bombers. Uh, the AI and, well, the AI especially, you know, a, a, a human player may do something different, but the AI in this game just loves to to get all over Georgetown. So we will probably lose most of those buffaloes there, but again, we don't want to just give them a free run at Georgetown. It is pretty well defended here. It's got, you know, these this fortress, the Penang Fortress, which makes it more formidable. Uh, so big guns, and uh, you know, we'll try to hold on there for a while, just like every other place up and down the coast here. So that's Georgetown. Uh, Johar Baru, okay. Uh, Johar Baru is down here. It is the gateway to Singapore. It is, you know, just a click north uh, of Singapore. And yeah, I wrote this down mainly because we're just running some ASW here, which I found interesting because there will be Japanese subs here, you know, very quickly, very quickly. And that's part of the reason the Prince of Wales um, and the Repulse were waiting. You know, it, it's for mines, it's for submarines, it's for bombing. I mean, they're under a triple threat from, from the start of the game. Uh, but we're going to get some ASW out here. We're going to look around a little bit, see what's going on. And, you know, Joe Harbaru, we will be bringing troops here. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about ground units. Uh, I was thinking back about the, the basic tutorial about ground units, and I'm not sure that we talked that much about retreat. Um, I know that we talked about quote-unquote zones of control. They work a little bit differently in this game. Uh, basically, if you've entered a hex from a direction, then you control that hex side. Okay, uh, but these troops, so at Kota Baru, when they get hit by this Japanese landing task force, when they get hit by these units, if they start to get overwhelmed, they will retreat. And they will retreat to a hex side that we control. Now, right now, we control this hex, we control this hex. The only hex side the Japanese control is this one. Assuming they came from here. Now we're starting on January, or we're starting on December 8th. You know, uh, I guess it's possible they could have landed here and came up here, but I just know from playing the December 7th, that's not how it goes. They land right here at Kota Baru and they unload here. So this is the only hex side. So as these troops, our troops, get driven back, they could retreat here more likely they will retreat here but that hop happens automatically you don't have to they they won't just stand here to the last man based on their uh, leadership their leader will decide to start retreating them back generally i find that they try to retreat back on railroads or roads main roads uh, and will also you know they will go back to the direction of a major base. They're pretty smart about it. They don't do anything crazy. Like this guy is not going to just all of a sudden, you know, start like trying to come up here or something. Uh, the game's just not coded that way. They will pretty much always just fall back to safety where more troops are, more of their own kind are, or to bigger bases or down major thoroughfares. So Anyway, I, I just don't think that we had talked about that because once you play the game for a while, it just kind of becomes second nature. You see it happening. Uh, so maybe I just didn't think to, to mention that. But they will retreat on their own as they start to become overwhelmed. Now, I did want to say down here at um, Johar Baru is that we do have this Australian group here. 
This is the 27th Australian Brigade. Now, as you see, unfortunately, they are attached to the Malaya Army. We cannot get them off of the Malaya Peninsula without paying. Now, we could pay to get them out, but that is going to be 334 political points. You may remember at the start of the game, we have a hundred, 100. We do get more every turn, of course, but nothing like the amount that it would take to spend 334 to take this Australian unit out. Um, and so, you know, they're an assault strength of 95. They're a good unit. We're leaving them at, we're leaving them here. So we've got one unit at Mersing, one Australian unit here. This is the 22nd Australian. This is 89. To buy them out of the Malayan army, it would cost 292. So at Johar Baru, it costs, you know, this is a little better unit. It's going to cost 334. It's very hard to justify spending that many political points to get these units out. And I know when you first start playing the game, or if you're not experienced playing the game, you see this green unit counter and you think, oh, I bet you, you know, one of the first things I should do is get them to Singapore and get them out because they're Australian. You know, they're, they're not even supposed to be here quote unquote, you know, it, of course you're going to think that way. I think that I spent the first two or three playthroughs I ever played of this game figuring out the best, best way to get these Australian units out, sending transports up here to get utterly destroyed, uh, losing all kinds of points, and then eventually losing them anyway, because I couldn't get them out. I think a few times I, I've gotten them on transports uh, and they've been destroyed on the transport getting out. So, you know, these guys are most likely going to stay here in Malaya, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And, and I just wanted to say, you know, as an, a, a newer player, don't get fooled into thinking, oh, well, just because they're Australian, they, there's some special need to get them out of here. They are part of the Malayan army. That's how the order, you know, the command chain was set up before the war. There's only so much you can do. It would be nice to have these extra Australian troops, but you have a lot of other Australian troops. So getting them out does not have to be a priority. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about uh, Joe Harboru is we do have the core, the core headquarters for the third Indian Corps here, okay? And so almost all of these British troops on the peninsula are part of the third Indian and this is their core headquarter now when you were setting up if you were setting up along with the spreadsheet you noticed that Cole made a notation saying you know General Heath is terrible <laughs> he's 45 admin 49 aggression only a 45 on land um, you know, that's from one to a hundred, right? So he's below average about everything and he's leading an entire army that's very important here in Malaya. Um, but he goes on to note that if you want to trade him out, it would cost 125 political points and um, there's nobody to change him out for at this point. So this is the first turn. Eventually some names will show up. But you see here, 32 leadership and 19 inspiration. It's not only like this guy doesn't lead men, men actively do not want to be led by him. Uh, this is everything you do not want in a general. I know that I, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I know that I've talked about the fact I don't change a lot of generals or admirals in this game. Uh, this is someone you would definitely want to change if it made sense from a political point perspective. Now look, you know, some people say, I'm gonna hang on to Singapore to the death. Is it possible to do? Sure, uh, it is possible to do, especially against the AI. That being said, the chances are that you are going to lose Singapore. You know, it's better than a 50-50, it's probably better than a 70-30, to be honest with you. So you know, having Heath here does not help your chances, but ultimately these are probably doomed troops, even if you bring, you know, some kind of mixture of 
Scipio Africanus and Hannibal over here to lead them, you know, it's you're probably not going to hold Singapore either way. And it just costs a lot. I mean, to change a leader, 125 political points, pretty steep right at the start of the game. Later on, when we've built up a bunch of political points, eh, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But uh, right now, it's more than we even have on turn one. We couldn't even do it, but we could probably do it on turn two. But remember, you're going to want to be buying some troops out and moving them around you know, buying them out of their uh, command. So, you know, it, just spending 125 here doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I did want to point that out. Now, whenever you do see these core headquarters or any headquarters, though, I do want to say I don't want to downplay changing leadership too much because I know some people like to do it and are very good at getting their leaders right where they want them to be, where right where they're important. Always come up here and click on it. You might as well look, right? And now you've got a notation in your mind okay, Lewis Heath is not good. Uh, actually, I kind of want to read up about him and what, what his deal was, why he was so bad. He was probably, truth be known, I, I don't know this, I'm just guessing, but knowing how the British operated at this time, he was probably a colonial leader of some sort, had maybe been, you know, the, the head of the Malayan, he was probably a lord from England that got sent over here and said, here, you can have some free land in Malaya, and ends up becoming a general. Now, I don't know if that's absolutely true. I'm guessing. I'm sure someone in the comments will say, that's absurd. That's not what happened. But that's how I try to imagine it or would think it possibly happened. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Kota Baru. So we looked at Johar Baru. Now we're going to go up to Kota Baru. And Kota Baru is... You know, this is Operation Zero, right? This is where the war is really kicking off for us in the British troops. We now have Japanese in a hex with us, and that is at Kota Baru. Now, we have gotten the planes out, okay? So we've reassigned the planes that were here. Um, we've sent the torpedo bombers down to Singapore, okay? And we are not moving these units. And I know that if you weren't looking at the spreadsheet or you hadn't played the game before and you looked at the situation on the ground here, you may start trying to retreat back. Um, no, we're going to try to hold here. And one thing, this is kind of a, a, a tip from someone who you know, has played this game a lot. Don't be very quick to just give up when you're defending against a landing force. And you'll find this out as the allied player later in the game, that it is very difficult to get enough troops and enough material and enough supply onto a coastal hex, land them there, attack, and take out a decent defending force. Now, I say decent. We've got 47 assault strength, 88 assault strength, a base force that is already building fortifications. That is not terrible, right? If you think about the old maxim, it's three to one. As an attacker, you need three to one. We've got 120 here. They're going to have to land, you know, especially since they're coming off troop transports, they're going to have to land three or 400 assault strength here to take us out in force. Now, they may wear us down, they may beat up our fortifications and then eventually take, you know, or bring troops to the south. But this is not the kind of spot where you just say, oh, okay, I'm going to give you this hex. I'll see you later. I'm headed down the coast. You know, uh, this is a de decently defensible spot with an 88 and a 47 uh, assault strengths here. So, you know, like I said, you've got like 130. It may take a, up to like a 400 assault strength to really attack you in the way that you, you know, should be attacked here defending. And we've already built up a future objective. This gives us a bonus, of course. Uh, this one's an 80, so it's been at Kota Baru for some time. Now, these guys will be getting bombed from the air like crazy, and that will wear them down. They will eventually have to retreat. Um... Uh, but if you're gonna if you're gonna throw up a defense here and try to put up blockers, this you might as well do it here when they're getting off troop transports 
and these guys are already used to the terrain and the area they've set it as an objective and they already have that up to 60 and 80 you might as well do it here as opposed to you know why fall back to here and then you're dealing with the exact same stuff now this is better terrain to defend um, but you know ultimately that's not that big of a difference uh, this is just a better spot to defend so stay there uh, while talking about Kota Baru, you know these Dutch subs and I already showed you know they're where they're going to be patrolling here they will be sitting right here because the Japanese of course have landed this force but as you'll see it's not the darkest of dark red here's a dark red this is a lighter pink right this is telling us this is not a massive force uh, we all we have right now is we see three enemy units okay we have spotted 900 troops eight guns no uh, no vehicles and that's it okay well that doesn't sound that crazy I mean let's look at our uh, let's look at what we've got we've got 738 infantry here we've got 10 you know based on what we've spotted at this point we actually outnumber the Japanese now that's probably not gonna last but that also means that they probably will be bringing troop transports this way to try to unload offload more or they may be already sitting here and we just can't see them because we don't have detection on them yet um, and so these subs are gonna be hunting right here because okay let's just say that they don't even have troop transports coming over they are going to have to supply this base by bringing these forces in so there are going to be Japanese ships right here ripe for the taking so that that'll be fun we've got these Dutch subs out here they're good subs they do a nice job they've got good torpedoes maybe most importantly right um, and so we will be laying in wait so that is really Kota Baru. It's going to be fun, you know, right off the bat. Uh, it's going to be action time. So we'll get to see some of that. Uh, Kuala Lumpur is the next thing that I had on my list. So Kuala Lumpur is right here. And Kuala Lumpur is your first fallback, right? So we've got Singapore, obviously, is the ultimate prize. This is the gem. But our fallback our initial fallback spot here is Kuala Lumpur now we've already talked about how we're taking these troops from Alor Star the 11th division and we're putting them here we're gonna reform that division that is some decent size you know uh, let's go look at their assault strengths again we've got um, 105 104 and this is probably the better way to do it we've got 105 105 104 we also have uh, an anti-tank regiment here okay in this field regiment <clears throat> I think that these have to build up a little bit we can go look yeah they're a little damaged right now so they can build up you know kind of reform reconstitute by the time that this builds up here at Kuala Lumpur we may have a four to five hundred assault value unit in that 11th division especially once we put them together that is not shabby for early in the game so we will make it very difficult for the Japanese to come take Kuala Lumpur and again this is our fail safe to get these guys out to get these other troops out we want to block here at Kuala Lumpur again you got to watch that they don't get around you at Mersing but that is also why we're keeping Australian troops there um oh Kuala Lumpur this is interesting this is something we haven't talked a ton about we have talked about your Air Force's command structure a little bit right uh, that you need these command groups because this is where you get torpedoes so to torpedo ordnance I will note on the spreadsheet it tells you to pick up some torpedoes they cannot do that yet I well it didn't even give me the option to do it it could be one of two things it's either because it's the December 8th scenario and so you could on December 7th but you can on December 8th uh, or it could be because 
I hit strategic move and we're packing and unpacking already. Or it could be because, um, oh gosh, what was my third thought? It could be because we have to get this to Singapore first. Um, and I think that, well, actually, now I'm glad that we came here. I thought I had set that to Singapore. Oh, I know what it was. We set the future objective to Singapore. I just had not. You're supposed to wait a turn. And I did not do that. Oh, well, my mistake. Okay. Anyway, back to the point at hand. These will get down. These guys will get down to Singapore. We'll set up a torpedo ordinance of 20 or 40. I can't remember what the exact number is, but we'll pull them when we get down to Singapore. Now, why did I want to talk about this group RAF though? So it's your air headquarters for the 223rd. If we look at some of our planes out here, we've got the 223. So this is British, right? Royal Air Force, RAF, 223, 223. Now this is 224, 224, 224. Okay. Uh, and we could keep going through this. This is the 223rd, though. We're sending them to Singapore. Where is the 224th? The 224th is down here, 224 Group or RAF. Now, you will see that we are setting its future objective to Darwin. We are going to get this on a troop transport and take it to Darwin, the 224th. So that will give you some idea of some of the planes that we want to get out of here. The 224 planes eventually... We're going to try to get them out of Singapore, base hop, and get them down to Australia. Now, you know, you can see there's a hodgepodge here, 223. We actually saw a 221 up here, uh, a 223, a 224, you know, so it's a little bit of everything. But we are bringing the 223 down here. Now, we do not have move orders on the 224 yet. We have just set its future objective to Darwin. So early on, we're going to have the 223 and the 224 Group RAF right here providing all kinds of aviation support at Singapore, uh, where it's most important right now, right? Eventually, the 224 will get out. Now, as the Allied player, the British RAF has four main air headquarters at the start. They have the 223 and the 224. They have, then they also have the 221, which is up here in Rangoon. Okay. And they have the 222, which is over here in Colombo. And I just wanted to point that out to you because, you know, sometimes you see these things randomly on the map and you don't really know how they relate or they work together. Um, but this is how the British had their Air Force command structure set up at the start of the war. Now, 222 is attached to the uh, headquarter, Indian headquarters, the AHQ in India. So that's the 222 in Columbia, or Columbia, Colum Columbia, South Carolina. No, Colombo uh, in Rangoon. Let's see, I think they're attached to Burma, maybe? AHQ Bengal, okay. You can see AHQ Bengal is part of AHQ India. So it's all part of the India command. Um, but you've got that down there. So these are the main four. And then you have one, again, in Koala. But we're bringing it down here to Singapore. So you'll have the 223 and the 224 here with the 224 eventually scheduled to ship out to Darwin. So I did want to just kind of show you that to kind of give you a big picture. This is where the British the hot spots they think of the air war are and how their command structure works. Uh, oh, Kwantan. I wanted to also mention this. So here's Kwantan, and this is another one where, you know, we got to be careful. Now we're marching this guy up here to Tumula. Uh, we have a base force here that's sticking around, and then another group to Tumula. Now, so Tumula is here, right? So we've got the two active forces, the two forces that are not base forces, moving up to Tamula, and then eventually you'll see they're set for Singapore, both of them. So we're, we're going to get them to Tamula and then rail them down to Singapore. Now you may be saying, well, how does this differ from Mersing? Well, the main way that this differs from Mersing, so let's say the Japanese come and land here and take Kwantan. Um, Let's say that they take that. What did I call it the first time? Kuantan? No, it's Kwantan. Let's say that they take that. Okay, now what? Well, for them to get around behind us, they would have to 
cross a river, move 46 miles, another 46 miles to get over here. That doesn't seem very realistic. If they landed here, they would probably start coming up this way. You've got a railway, whatnot. I'm not saying it's impossible, but we don't have the same considerations that we have at Mersing. At Mersing, if they land here, they're one hex away from cutting off all of our forces on a major highway, okay? That is not the situation at Quanton. You know, you can only do what you can do Right, and so would we prefer to have a big force at Quanton? Of course we would. But ultimately, these guys are going to get taken out. We might as well get them here, rail them to Singapore, and you don't have the same threat of an envelopment that you do at Mersing. The other thing I wanted to talk about here at Quanton were these bombers. Um, we are actually going to be... Oh, not it's not the bombers yet. We It's the recon. It's the recon. We'll be talking about the bombers that we're going to be flying a night bombing mission on here in a moment. Uh, but first of all, we're going to run some recon on Patani. And I did want to bring this up because it's not something that, you know, we've done a whole lot of or talked about. Now, please note, this unit needs to be removed by December 19th, 1941. We essentially have 11 days until these guys will be removed from the board and we'll have to do that. It will be withdraw group. Um, we're not going to do that yet. We are instead going to send them on dang near a suicide mission up to Patani. So we just hit recon and then we select our target. Once you hit select target, we're going to go up here to Patani. We want to see what the Japanese have here. We do not have good uh, well, actually, we have a 6-6 six, six detection here. So I guess we're kind of running this up here to see what they have at Kota Baru, because we'll be flying over that. It's possible we'll get some detection there. Um, and also, very early on, they will be landing more at Patani. Isn't this where you would land? I mean, as a Japanese player, this is where I would land forces. They've already got some forces here that will probably come this way, but I would land some forces at Patani and you know come around this way or come down to Kota Baru and start going this way so we're going to go up there and see what they've got going on um, which brings me to those bombers and let's go look at them this is the 3184 oh and if you notice as you're setting up if you're ever having problems finding units these are in numerical order so You've probably, if you're setting up along with me, you've probably already noticed this at some point, but I'm just telling you in case you haven't, it's very helpful. This is unit 308, right? This is unit 309, 325, 320. These will always be in unit numerog <laughs> numerological order. So it follows, you know, from lowest to highest in their unit ID. So you can always find them, you know, you can say, oh, here's the... Uh, you know, 3076th, and there's the 3184, which just so happens to be what we're looking for. And what are we doing here? This is the first time we've run a mission like this. We are doing an airfield attack. <coughs> Excuse me. We're doing an airfield attack. We picked that. We targeted Patani. We just hit select target, and we targeted Patani. And that's why we're running this recon mission to Patani, we're going to get more eyes on the bomber bombing area. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is these recon guys are going to fly out in the morning, but unlike anything we've ever done before, we change these guys to flying night operations. Okay, and this is where you do it. Now, we don't do this a lot as the allied player because our pilots are not very experienced. We don't have radar yet. Uh, we essentially just don't, <laughs> we don't have the equipment. You see, we don't have any radar here. We don't have the equipment to, um, of course, you know, radar. We don't even have ground radar. Um, we don't have the equipment to run night operations, really, uh, especially early in the war. The Japanese will shred us up because they just have more experienced pilots. They're better at night. We don't have that. But on this one, which is kind of like one of these, uh, let's throw the Japanese off a little bit. Let's do something a little unexpected. We're going to run the recon flight up here during the day, get eyes on targets, and then 
the first night of this war, we are going to send some bombers up here. 11 of them, I believe. Nope, 14 of them. We're going to send them up to Patani and we're going to bomb their airfield and try to put some you know, put some damage on their airfield, maybe slow them down by a day or two of flying missions out against us to Georgetown, Kota Baru, maybe even down to Kuala Lumpur. So it's, you know, it's like a wild card play kind of, uh, is this going to have any lasting effect? No, uh, they will fix this airfield very quickly. Do we know what size of airfield they have? Uh, we see the port. Yeah, they've got a size three. There are three and seven down there for air capacity or up there on air capacity. So, okay, cool. Uh, but let's, you know, try to knock that down, do some damage and maybe keep their bombers off of us for a day or two. It's just kind of uh, one of those wild card things. It's not going to make a huge difference in the end, but it, but it's fun. Um, we already talked about the Australians at Mersing. Mersing was the next place I was going to go. We've talked about these Australians. They're going to stick around. One thing uh, I did want to point out here is this anti-air, <clears throat> and there's another one over here at Malacca. One of these we're sending to Christmas Island. This one, so, or sorry, this one at Mersing, the anti-aircraft, we're going to send out here to Christmas Island number 10. And the one over here at Malacca, anti-air, we are going to send over to the Cocos Islands. And really that's because these two places, Mersing and Malacca, are not huge magnets for Japanese air power. Now they may hit Mersing, but really Malacca, not as much. They're mainly going to, go, going to be going after Georgetown, Kota Baru, Kuala Lumpur, and Singapore. Those are the places they're going to be hitting. So we're going to take this AA <clears throat> that, you know, maybe we could just stick in Singapore and it would be helpful because the AA in Singapore is going to really hurt the Japanese quite a bit. Uh, but we've got some AA there. We've got some good AA there. So we're going to take these, I don't want to call them surplus requirements because every little bit of AA that we can get helps. But we're going to first, you know, First, they'll be in Singapore, so we'll let them sit there for a little bit. But then eventually, we're going to bring them to Cocos and Christmas Island because we don't have AA there. And, you know, if the Japanese take Oosthaven, Batavia, they will start hitting here. And it would be nice to have some anti-aircraft, you know, just to slow them down a bit. So I wanted to point that out because it's something a little bit different or something you'd say, hey, wait a minute, what are we doing there? Well... Again, they're not surplus requirements, but they're also a little more extra than we have in other places. So we're going to take that AA and go put them on those islands. So finally, for this one, we've got Singapore. And that's, you know, the big one. One of the great cities of the world, one of the great ports in the world is Singapore. As you can see, we have already gotten hurt. A little bit. We got bombed on the first night of the war, December 7th, and the port has taken some damage. So, you know, you can see it's just, it's taken a bit of damage. It's showing red there. Um, this, we have shipyard repair. We've got 50 repair shipyard, and we will be using that. Now, we have put almost everything that's damaged. So we've got, you know, the Meritus or Meritus, Meritus. I'm going to call it the Meritus. It's a light cruiser out here. Uh, it's got a 10 system damage. We're putting all of these in the shipyard because we can, and it really speeds it up. If you looked at it, most of these had uh, 16 days, 17 days, 33 days. Now this may not match up with yours because I, I can't remember which one it is. I think it's maybe the Dominion Monarch that they that Cole said, hey, leave this as pure side. The reason he did that is it speeds everything else up. If you don't put it in the shipyard, I put it in the shipyard anyway. I'm going to try to get all of these out as fast as I can. I'm sure he did that because the light cruiser, I think only it only takes two or three days if you don't put anything extra in. Uh, but I, I put the extra one in there. Uh, you'll see that we're only using 30,000 tons. And we do have 50,000 tons, so essentially everything that needed repair here, we're throwing into the shipyard. As discussed before, we have disbanded Task Force Z, 
Prince of Wales, the Repulse. You also have three destroyers here. We will send them out with uh, task forces, uh, troop transport task forces, to the extent we are getting troops out, because there are certain troops, like this New Zealand group, right? We are setting its objective to Savu Savu. And if you get to a point in the game where you don't necessarily remember, hey, what, you know, which of these troops am I trying to move somewhere else or whatnot? Generally on this first turn going through the spreadsheet, you're setting their future objective if we're getting them off of the peninsula, okay? So these guys are going Savu Savu. I know there's a few others I don't necessarily want to go through. Okay, well, here's one. We're moving this infantry group to Mersing. They're already marching, but that's not really the point I was making here. This one, we're strategic moving, Savu Savu. Uh, we talked about having the 220, okay, well, here's another good example, the 224 group RAF that we were just talking about. We've got the future objective set to Darwin. So even though we haven't put any move orders in, if you start flipping through these, you can look back and say, oh, I set the future objective to Darwin. You know, these guys were taking off the peninsula. So wanted to point that out. Uh, I wanted to point out the big tanker task force that we have going to Palembang because we did have a number of tankers here. This is an Australian task force, uh, even though it does have some British ships in it. Uh, it's Australian, I think, because the Vendetta is Australian, and that is the flagship. Uh, but we're taking these tankers, which all have really nice capacity, we're putting them down in Palembang. Now make sure you set their home port to Palembang so they don't come down here, do nothing, and then start sailing back up here and get blown out of the water. Uh, make sure you set your home port to Palembang. We are going to fill them up with as much fuel as we can here uh, with some of this fuel, which will grow very quickly. We're going to fill those up. We'll probably eventually take them to Perth, uh, maybe to Darwin, but we'll sail them out of here through the strait and, and quite probably take them all the way to Perth. Um, also at Singapore, okay, we talked about the RAS. Oh, uh, Percival. Okay, so here is your main headquarters for the Malayan army. It's their army headquarters. So we already saw the third Indian army's headquarters, right? And if we go back and look at that at Kuala Lumpur, I believe. Nope. Uh, oh no, it's uh, it's here. Okay, yeah, it's at Johar Baru. Uh, we looked at them, 3rd Indian Corps, Corps Headquarter, right? Command Radius 1. Well, their direct superiors are up here at this command base, which is the Malayan Army Army Headquarters, okay? And they report directly to the Far East Command ABDA. So this is the overall big command here at Malay. The problem is, is you have another terrible general. So Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, we'll click on him. He's a 35, 25. He's only 40 aggressive. He's best for rear area headquarters. I, you know, question whether he's best at anything, right? Uh, he's only a 32 on land. A, just a ter a horrific general, if you will. But it costs, again, it costs 150 political points to replace him. We're pretty much stuck with Percival, unfortunately. So we've got bad generalship out here at Malaya, but we're stuck with it. Um, and with that, I think that's really all. In Singapore, we set up a lot of task forces. Um, oh, I think there is one amphibious group I did want to talk about. Oh, note, note that everything we've turned repair off here at Singapore, even if you were to hold on to Singapore, it is going to get bombed so extensively that it doesn't, you know, you couldn't even repair it fast enough if you wanted to, but, you know, a betting man would say that Singapore is going to fall to the Japanese. You might as well let them destroy their, what is going to become their stuff. Uh, so back to this amphibious group, and here it is, Amphibious Kuching. 
we took one of the destroyers, the Tenedos, we put it in here. We put um, we put this patrol gunboat in here just to, you know, it runs a four anti-sub, which is pretty dang good. So we put that in there. What does our uh, destroyer do? Two. Okay. So actually the patrol gunboat's running better uh, anti-sub than our destroyer, which is kind of sad. Um, we have put together this amphibious task force, and we are going to go save our men, gentlemen. We are going to come down here. We've set a waypoint, and we're going to come over here to... Oh, let's take that six off so we're not seeing the patrol zones. We are going to come over here to Kuching, and we are going to save our guys. And we've got three groups over here. We've got a base force, okay? We've got uh, the Sarawak Coastal Defense Unit. Okay, and we've got uh, the 215th Punjab. So you remember the 316th Punjab is headed up to Alor Star. We've got the 215th over here. We are going to pick these guys up, and we've got enough transports to do that in this task force. We have got four, okay? Um, they don't have great capacity at all. We're not sending our best. Let's put it that way. Transports with only an eight victory value, you're not sending your best. Yet we are sending someone to go get these guys out of Kuching. And then now we've got our home port set back at Singapore. Eh, we may end up taking these guys somewhere else. We will also have to remember to put them in strategic mode we don't want to do that yet in case they get attacked immediately. We do not want them to be in that prone position. Uh, but as this task force sails out, we will want to get them uh, into... Well, we'll have to see when we set up Sarawak. We may, we may actually put them in strategic mode because this is not that far of a jump. You know, Let's look at that task force again and see how far it's going to go. I may have misspoken. Uh, okay, yeah. So, I mean, they've got all at least 12 speed. Okay, so they're going to be, you know, bing, bang, boom. They're going to be right there. Uh, they'll be here within two days, essentially. So when we do set up Sarawak, I'm almost certain now that we will change those units over to strategic move. Well, here we are. We've reached the hour mark where I like to stop these Let's Plays. Uh, luckily, I think we've covered... A lot of the interesting things. Did we cover everything? Well, of course not. Uh, but I think that we covered most of what is really interesting in Belay, what is new, what is, you know, some maybe tips and tricks, whatnot. Uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, and as always, this is Strategy Gaming Dojo. Thank you so much for joining me. If you uh, did enjoy this, and you haven't already, please give me a subscribe. I would appreciate it, or a thumbs up. Let me know how I'm doing. Put any questions you have in the comments. I'm always happy to answer those. So again, thank you so much. I'll talk to you next time.